Okay, let's start. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so Uri couldn't be here this week, so I'm filling in. Um, I sent a, a, a message on the Moodle about this, the content of this uh, TA. Uh, we're not going to talk about aging. I had a lot of uh, people come to me um, and ask me about kind of the math needed for the course. Um, and this is why this, this TA is, is kind of just trying to get us all on the same page in terms of the math. If some of you are from more quantitative subjects like physics or math or computer science, much of this may s seem trivial or boring and you can go. That's fine. Um, uh, so it, this is just, I'm going to start really from the beginning. I just want everyone to kind of see the math that I think we're going to need for the rest of the course. Okay? Um, okay, so this is the topics. And first we'll talk about derivatives. I imagine that all of you have seen some version of this over your academic uh, journey. Um, but let's just really, so if we have a function f of x, right, we can talk about its derivative, which we denote by f prime x, or I like this better, df of dx. Now the derivative, the meaning of a derivative means how does a function change when I change the parameter itself, right? So if I have a function f of x, the derivative is the slope at each point. And it's a function itself, okay? Um, and the, the way, how do we know it's the slope? We can see it from this, df by dx, right, is the reason we say df, it's like saying delta f over delta x. Delta meaning a change in f. So it's like when you take a, a certain point and you take another point right next to it and you ask how much did f change between them divided by how much did x change between them. That's the meaning of a derivative. Okay, um, so let's just take some very simple examples. So if f of x is 5, right? So the derivative is 0 because there's no change. f is just constant. <coughs> All right? So in, if f of x is x, then the derivative will be just 1. And in general, if f of x is some polynomial, which we say x to the power n, so we'll f of it, the derivative of f will be n x n minus 1, right? So that's just very basic um, introduction to uh, derivatives. Some properties of derivatives. If I have f plus g, g is another function, and I take the whole derivative of them. Can you change your marker? No, yeah, you don't see? Here? Yeah, yeah. No, but it's an x, but then it's also like another number. I think the what you're talking about is integration. Yeah. Now this is just. Yeah, I'm wrong. Okay. Cool. Sorry. Yes, it is. N minus one. Yeah, n minus one. Hey, do you have like a darker marker? Yeah, I'll try. Oh, let's see. I think this is better. I'll try and then if not, we'll... Uh... Okay, some more properties of derivatives. So if we have two functions, f and g, right, the derivative will just be the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. That means that taking the derivative is uh, additive. It's linear. If I have, uh, and also, um, if I have, some function, some constant times a function, and I take that derivative, then the constant c just goes outside, right? And maybe the most important rule that you're going to use all the time, hopefully, if you ever use deri der derivatives, is if you have a function f, and that function you can, you can think of it as the function of a different function, f of g of x. So 
when I take df by dx, I can what it's equal to taking df by dg and then dg by dx. Okay, that's the chain rule. This is very important, very useful. Let's just take a really easy example to see how this is useful. Um, so for instance, um, no, let's, let's look at examples in a bit. I'm just, first let's talk about the properties and then we'll, we'll, talk, we'll give examples. Um, what else? Okay, so we gave some examples there. Let's give another important, a very important as well uh, example. Oh, when f of x is e to the x, an exponent, also very important. So its derivative is, does anyone know? Is just the same. So it's the only function that when you, when you take its derivative, it equals itself. There are a lot of funny math memes on Twitter about this. Okay, so now let's use the chain rule. Let's say f of x is e to 5x. So how do I know, how do I take this derivative? So we, we can think about it that f, f is actually a function of 5x, right? So 5x is this g. So when I want to take its derivative, I can do df by d5x, right? And then d5x by dx. I'm using this. So when I take the derivative of f, f of 5x, which is e to the 5x, it's just going to be e to the 5x. And the derivative of 5x by x, right, using what we know here, is just 5. Okay? Questions? Can you repeat the last part? Chain reaction, yeah. Uh, chain rule. Yeah. <laughs> this wasn't clear? Yeah. Okay. Let's, um, let's go again. We can think about it that it's like, right, if I say f of x is e to the 5x, right, I can also say that f of g a 5g would just be e to, uh, wait, why am I getting confused? Yeah, let's just do it like this. This would be easier. This may be a bit. So I'm taking e to the 5x, like that, okay? So I'm deriving e to the 5x by 5x. So this is kind of just the same to say derivative of e to, let's call it, g by dg. And we said this would be just, right, this would just be e to the g. g is 5x for us. Okay, an easier way to think about the chain rule is um, you just, when I have something like this, just the, the inside of the derivative goes down. So the inside of the derivative would be 5, so it comes down here, and then we have e to the 5x. And e to the 5x stays, right, because this part would give me e to the 5x. So it would be Right, this part would give me e to the 5x, and this part would give me 5. Why did you derive I wanted to show you the chain rule. How else would you derive it? So because, I mean, because if I know this, and if I know this, now I want to know how I derive this. Let's take another example, maybe. Okay, let's take another example. Let's say I have f of x equals e to x squared plus x. Okay, so it's going to be, I'm going to derive this.
by considering this whole thing, let's just call this thing G. Right? So I can, it's, this is like saying f of G is e to the G. I just called this G. And now when I want to derive this thing, so I would do df by dx, right? I'm going to use the chain rule, df by dg, dg by dx. And this is f of g. So f of g is this, and we said that it doesn't change. So it's just going to be e to the g. And when I derive, when I take dg by dx, which is this thing, right, I need, I can use this. So I'm going to have 2x plus 1. And now I'm going to plug back g, because g is this thing. So I got e to the x squared plus x, 2x plus 1. Chain rule. Okay, are there questions? No. Oh, yes, no? Okay. Um, okay. Maybe I'll just give one more, uh, just one more um, property. If I have f divided by g, and I want to take the derivative of that, right, it's going to be f, the derivative of f times g minus the derivative of g times f divided by g squared. It's a bit strange. You can work it out. Uh, it's like a straightforward um, proof, but just something to remember. I don't think we're going to use it, but just to brief your memory on all the properties of derivatives. Okay. Okay, let's move on to integrals. Questions, comments, protests. What's your name? What? What's your name? Ben. Ah, Ben. I didn't say. Ben. Okay. Oh, and also I don't sing, so sorry. I mostly frown instead. Okay, so we talked about int derivatives. Okay, and we gave some examples and properties. Now let's talk about integrals. Okay, so there's several ways to think about integrals and they're all equivalent. So the first one, and maybe the most intuitive to think about, is if I have a function f of x, and it looks like this, and this is called, let's call it a, and this is called b. So the integral of f of x dx from a to b is this area. I imagine you've all seen this at some point. So Integral is kind of thinking about the area under a curve. Another way to think about integration is that if I have some function f of x and I take its derivative, which we, which we talked about just now, f prime of x, right? This is derivative. And if I take the integral over the derivative, I get back the original function plus some constant. We'll talk about that. Okay, so in that sense, an integral is the opposite of a derivative. 
but it's also this. And if it isn't clear why these two are equivalent, that's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it's not something we're going to talk about because it's not very important. But it's not <laughs> trivial, I think. I think it is interesting that these two are the same. OK? Um, questions until now about what is an integral? OK, so, so let's just say area under the curve from A to A to B. And also antiderivative. It's both this and this. OK, so now let's uh, give some examples. So what would be the integral? Oh, OK, and let me say one more thing. I'm sorry. Sorry, this is what's called a definite integral. What do I mean by definite? I told you that it starts at A and ends at B. This is why it's the area from here to here. What I talked about here, I didn't give you A and B. This is called an indefinite integral. It's like the general form indefinite integral is one without bounds. And the definite integral would be the, the, the area from a certain place to a certain place. Now when I do an indefinite integral, I will always get a constant. OK? Why? Why do I always get some constant that I don't know what it is, and it depends? Let's just take a very easy example. So let's say I have f of x equals 5x plus 7, and I have g of x equals 5x plus 10. And now we said, and now I know that f prime of x would be 5, and g prime would also be 5, right? But if I take the integral, which means the opposite, right, if I try to do this for this 5, this is true and this is true, right? Because when I take a derivative, I'm always, the, the constant goes away, but when I integrate, I mean, when I take the integrals of this and this, I mean, I don't know. It'll just, there, any number will give me the same thing. A way to think about it is that um, you can think about it that, um, right, all of these lines are 5x plus some number. 5x plus 10, 5x plus uh, 5, 5x minus 1, and so on and so on. And they all have the same derivative. And when I, take the in, with, when I take the integral, let's say, of 5, I don't know which one of these I'm going to get. It could be any. The way to know what the C is is by giving what's called an initial condition. So for instance, how do I find what C is? You would need to tell me, oh, and also, just so you know, when f is 0, when, uh, when you take f of 0, when you take x equals 0, let's say you get uh, 5. This together with this, then I can find the right, the right uh, curve that I'm actually on. OK, so this is an indefinite integral, definite integral. OK, questions? OK, um, let's talk about some properties, which are also important. So if we have like what we said. Oh, and also maybe I'll talk about the notation. So um, the integral sign looks like this kind of long S. Why does it look like an S? It's very easy to remember. Because it's actually a sum, right? When we're talking about this area, 
you can think about this area as being comprised of many different rectangles, right? It's just a bunch of rectangles together. And when I'm talking about the area under the curve, it's just taking the sum of all of these rectangles together. What is the area of each rectangle? So the area of each rectangle would be its width times its height. Its height would be f of x, and its width is d of x, which is this tiny amount of x. So what this is actually saying is take the sum of all these really small rectangles where each one has a width d of x. That's the intuition behind the notation. So it's nothing mystical. It's just like a sum over rectangles. OK? Um, OK. So let's talk about some properties. So like, like uh, derivatives, if I have a sum of two functions, it would just be f dx plus g dx, right? If I have integral of some number c times f, and I'm just not using f of x here, like, but it's, it's implied. I'm just, getting, I'm just being lazy and not writing this each time. Uh, dx, so I'm just going to take c outside, and I'll have f of x dx, okay? So now we can also ask, the very simple example is, let's take an example, what would be the integral just of dx? Right, so we can think about it that's 1 times dx, right? And then the question is, let's take the antiderivative of 1. So what function, when I take its derivative, will give me 1? And that's x. So this would just be x, and like we said, plus some constant. Right, and then we can do the next example. x of dx. So what, num what function, when I take its derivative, will give me x? So you can check that it's this one, x squared over 2, and some constant. And we can take the next one, x to the x squared will give us x to the third over 3 plus c. And then we see that there's a pattern here, and it's very similar to the pattern of the derivatives. So in general, it's x n. When I take the integral of some polynomial, I'm going to get x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus some c. Okay, and now note that this n can be also negative. It could be minus 2. Sorry, it could be, my, yeah. I could also, if I wanted to talk about, for instance, the integral of this, right, 1 over x squared. So from the laws of uh, powers, this would just be x to the minus 2. It's just a, an equivalent way of writing things. Okay, dx. And then I can use this formula, right? So just my n here is minus 2. So I'm going to get x to the minus 1 divided by minus 1. So this is just minus 1 over x. Right? But there is one, one, um, one uh, anomaly or one uh, exception, sorry, that, that this doesn't work. And that is the integral of 1 over x. So if I were to use this formula with this, right, this is like saying the integral of x to the minus 1 dx. And if I were to put minus 1 in here, first of all, this would blow up, right? This would just be 1, and this would be infinity, right? Because I'm going to get minus 1 plus 1, so I can't divide by 0, right? So I can't use this here. But this is a really, really important integral. And you're going to use it in your homework. And 
Uh, there is a proof, but for now, I'm just going to ask you to remember it, and you can see it online. And the, the answer is the, um, oops, the answer is lan of x. Lan is the natural logarithm. So it's like the log of x base e, which is the Euler's constant. Okay, so there's, it's also interesting, like, how do you get this result? But we're not going to talk about that. This is, like, for a more calculus course. But you should remember this because it's, a, it's an exception, and it's very useful, and it shows up a lot. And we'll see later in this uh, TA where it shows up. Okay? Questions? Okay, uh, let's just take another example, the last example, the integral of e to the x, e to the x, and the integral of, let's say, e to the, let's call it a times x, <coughs> so I'm going to have e to the a times x, but I'm going to have something else as well. Divided by a. How do I remember that? Well, because remember, if we, if we take the derivative of this, the a drops down. So I need to cancel it out. Right? Because if we're going to take the derivative of this, let's just show this again. Let's derive this. So we said this is a constant, a. So I can take it out. We said constants don't matter. Constant just goes outside. And then I have e to the ax derivative. And if you remember what we did already uh, earlier, so it's going to give us e to the ax, but I'm also going to get another factor of a from the chain rule times a. So this cancels out with this. Okay? Very good. Okay. So now let's talk about something. This is all just to kind of brief us on, uh, on integrals and derivatives because we're going to need some of them. Let's talk about uh, differential equations. Okay. So let's talk about O, D, E's which are ordinary differential equations. Okay. So what is a differential equation? So we talked about, let's say we have some function f of x, and we talked about how to take its derivative, which we can write as df over dx. And a way to think about this again, stressing this, you can think about how a tiny change in x leads to a change in f. A delta f over a delta x. Now, an, uh, a differential equation is an equation that tells us something about, it tells us that f of x is somehow related intrinsically to its own derivatives. So what it tells us, it's a relationship between f of x and its derivative. What do I mean by that? So the, 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 the example that Uli talked about, and it's the one that's most often used and seen, and it, it comes up in many different places, in many different contexts, is when, when people say that df of dx is equal to f itself. Now, what does that mean? This is kind of weird. What it means is that when f is big, when this function is big, it means its slope is also big, right? Because this is the slope. And when f is small, its slope is also small. So it's a relationship between 
the function itself and it's slow. When the function is big, it changes a lot. When the function is small, it changes not so much. Right? If I were to write here um, df of the dx is 5, so we all know what f would be, right? We would take the integral and we would get, oh, f of, a, f of x is just 5x plus some constant. But here, we have a, something different. We have a, a, an equation that combines the function and its derivative. And this is the most simple type of differential equation that comes up. And it, and it, um, and it let's call it like that. Um, and you find it in radioactive decay. You find it, I think, in uh, some form of it in bacterial multiplying, I think. Um, you find it in, in population growth. So it kind of makes sense. Like, so let's think about it in population growth, for example, like intuitively. Okay? So let's say we're talking about a population of a million people. And then the question is, when I ask, when F is, let's say, the population, and DF by dx is how, is how much does that population grow? So the rate of growth. So when there's a million people, right, and everyone's, you know, partnered up and, and, uh, and reproducing. So because there's a million people, in the next generation there's going to be, I don't know, a few hundred thousand more because everyone's paired up. So that means that when f is large, also the rate of growth is large because there's going to be more babies when there's more people. And if the population was small, let's say like 10 people, so in the next generation there would only be 12 people. So that means that df of dx would be small because the, because the change in f is dependent on how much people there are. Okay? Okay, so now let's solve this. Now we'll see why it's so important. Okay, so how do we solve it? How do we solve this very simple basic differential equation? So I'm going to teach you how physicists solve this. Mathematicians may get upset, but I don't care um, because it works. Um, so the way to solve this is to think about this side as a fraction, right? Because we said that df over dx is kind of like a small change in f over a small change in x, right? So I can think about this as a fraction. And when I do that, I'm going to take f and put it down here. And I'm going to take dx and put it over here. I just move sides. Okay? And now, I'm going to take the integral of each side. And I can do that. When I have um, an equality, I just take the integral of each side. So I move dx over here and put f over here, and I took an integral. Now, let's do the right-hand side, which is easier. So alpha is just a constant. It goes outside. And the integral of dx is x. x, and let's say plus some constant. Right? And how about this one? Oh, very good. This is why it was so important. The natural logarithm of f. Right? Okay, so moving on, I'm going to open this up. And now we can notice that alpha times x is alpha x. And alpha times c is just some number. So I'm going to just change it. I'm just going to call it a different number. Let's call it, I don't know, n. I can call it alpha c, but it doesn't matter. It's just a number, and we're going to talk about what that number is shortly. 
And on the, le on the, on the left hand side, I have lan of f. By the way, why didn't I take plus c here as well? Why did I only do it here? So the answer is I could take it here as well. Let's, try, let's call it d. But then when I move d over here, right? If I move d over here, I'm going to get alpha c times d. Uh, my, uh, sorry, minus d. And just this thing I call it n. So it doesn't matter. I can take it only on one side. It's just, I'm just redefining the constant. And the constant, we don't know anything about it yet. So it doesn't matter. So if I take it here, I'm just going to swallow it into, into the constant here. So it's just making life easier. But there's no tricks here. OK. Um, so we have ln of f equals alpha x plus some number n. OK, and then what do I do from here? Exponential both sides. So just to make sure uh, people uh, aren't sure. So I'm going to take both sides and I'm going to put them e to the sum. I'm going to take the exponent of both sides. Why do I do that? Because, and this is uh, log rules of logarithms, when I take e to the logarithm of some number, it's just that number. That's kind of how logarithm is defined. It's like the opposite of the exponent. OK? So when I take e to the ln of f, I just get f. And here I'm going to get e to the alpha x plus n. Right? And now I can, again, I'm going to define this a bit differently. So this is going to be e to the alpha x. And this is um, rules of uh, powers, e to the n. And this is just a number. I don't know anything about it. But what I do know, right, f of x. But what I do know is that when, f equals zero, when x equals 0, right, this is 1 because e to the 0, any number to the 0 power is 1. So that's just 1 times n. Yeah, sorry e to the n. So that just means that e to the n is the initial f, right? Initial f. When x equals 0, I just have e to the n. So an, an easier way to write all of this would just be to say, and this is the final answer, f of x is f of 0 times e to the alpha x, where this I've called it f of zero, this I called f of zero. So this one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this line is okay? Yeah. Okay, so here I just want to, I just want to rewrite this because this is ugly, e to the n. It's just a number, remember, just a number, I don't know anything about it. But I don't like how it looks in the, in the equation. It doesn't tell me anything. So how do I make it nicer? So I notice that when I put in x equals 0, so e to the alpha 0 is 1. So that's just going to give me 1. So it means that, when, that f of 0 is this strange number, e to the n, which I don't know anything about it. Again, this is from the integral. So an easier way to think about this is just to define e to the n as what we're going to call it, f0. And then when I do that, it just, it's just a matter of definition. I get this function, and now this is much easier to me. What do I see here? That f starts off at some value called f0, and it rises exponentially. Because when f, when I plug in 0, right, I just get f of 0. I look at them like they're differentials. It's, uh, it's like the, I, not exactly a function, but I look at them as if they're separable. And as if they, what they mean is that I look at them as if they are this tiny thing. A tiny bit of x and a tiny bit of f. Yeah, general. 
general. No, it's a, it's a good, it's fine that you're asking. I mean, like I said, mathematicians don't like this way of solving it. But this is how we do it in physics. And I think, to me, it's much more intuitive. Because like what I said, you can think about it this way if you want. That every, every place you say you look at df, you can put like delta x. Or dx, you can put delta x. So I'm talking about these tiny bits of x and these tiny bits of f. And then I'm summing over them. I'm summing over all these tiny rectangles here. Remember, we talked about the rectangles. And I'm summing over all the tiny rectangles here. That's what I'm doing. On both sides. Right, because I, I have an equality. And then the way, what I do is I take, I take the exponent of both. It's like saying, you know, when a equals b, so also 5, a equal, 5 to the power of a equals 5 to the power of b. That's what I'm doing. So I took e to the ln of f, which is, which is just f because of this. And then I took e to the alpha x plus n. Which is, right, when, and because of rules of, uh, of uh, exponents, I mean, it's just like the multiplication of them. Yeah, this is, just, this is just a way to rewrite this part because it's ugly and it doesn't tell me anything. But when I look at it like this, it makes sense. It's, oh, okay, f starts at some number called f0 and it rises exponentially. Yeah? Uh, I mean, so this is exponential growth. So it's just like a question of when we, let's say we're talking about population, right? So when I mean it population, it'd be like the initial size of the population. So let's say I'm going to look at how a population grows from the year 2024 onwards. So F0 is the population on, uh, at the year 2024. Did you decide? I decide. decide? Yeah, I just, exactly. I decide. I can decide. I can take it back. It's all, it's all my... My choice. Yeah. There's nothing. There's a. I, I can decide what is zero exactly. So, uh, during the break, some people asked me some questions, and they were good questions, and it'll help me. Um, okay. So, firstly, someone asked me, "Wait, when I'm solving an equation, I usually get a number, like like in like when I solve an equation in algebra. But here, I don't get a number when I solve this, right? What am I solving for?" So the answer is a differential equation, right? It relates us, like we said, it's a relationship between f and its derivatives. And the solution is f itself. So I'm solving for the function. What is the function that, what, that, that, uh, that, uh, um, that behaves according to this relationship? And what we saw in this example is that it's this function. How does it look like? It looks like this. This is the graph f0 times e to the alpha x. So we start at f0, right? Because we said when x equals 0, it's f0. And it rises exponentially. This is the solution. The solution is not a number. The solution is a function. The solution to a differential equation is a function, not a number. You're solving for the function itself. What is the function that behaves according to a specific relationship? Okay, that's firstly. Someone else asked also what is this alpha? I should have said something. It's just a number. Um, as you can see, this alpha goes all the way over here. It could also be 1. And what it relates to is it relates to the rate of change. Now I'll explain what I mean by that. So um, what else did I want to? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so now this is, this is our, this is the solution to the simple differential equation we talked about here, OK? I should just also point out, if this wasn't clear, um, it didn't, df over dx, it didn't have to be f, OK? This is the specific equation that I'm solving for. But there are an infinite number of differential equations. I could also write df over dx equals f squared. I could write df over dx equals e to the f. Each of these is a different equation. Each of these will, will, the solution will be a different function that'll uh, fulfill the equation. The reason we're talking about this one is because it's so important. 
that you see it in so many different places, in so many different contexts. I try to give some examples here, but it's in more places. So it's like a very simple equation that comes up in a lot of different places, including this course. And that's why we talked about it. Um, so now, let me just say something about the solution we got. Um, okay. Let's take this away. Um, so we got that the solution to our equation. Okay, so let's just re remember the equation we're talking about is df over dx equals alpha f. Okay, I'm talking about it because it's important. I could be talking about something else, but this is what we want to talk about. And we saw that the solution to the equation is a function. The solution is the function f of x, which we said is f0 e to the alpha times x. That's the solution to the equation. Now, this is exponential growth. So what that means is we can ask the question, when does f double? Okay, at what x do I get twice as much f? So what I'm actually asking is what is the, what is the x, let's call it x d for x double, f of x double means that after some x, I'm going to get 2 f of f, f0. f0 is the initial one. Remember, see it over here. This is where we started, f0. My question is, when do I get to 2 f0? What is this? OK, that's the question. So when does f double? You have a question? Be careful with that. Um, yeah? Oh, we're, you're going to see it shortly. OK, so this is what I want. So, right? So if I plug in the function, I have f0 times e to the alpha times x double, right? So f0 goes away. So what's also interesting is no, so there, it doesn't matter what the initial f was. Okay? So what I have here is I have 2 equals e to the alpha times xd. And then I can do, take the logarithm of both sides. Okay? Natural logarithm. So I have logarithm of 2 equals, and like we said, the log, so maybe I'll say it here, e to the ln of x is x, and also ln to the e of x is x. This is the relationship between logarithms and exponents. So I take, this one, I take the logarithm to get rid of the exponent, so I just have alpha times xd, and I got that xd equals ln 2 over alpha. Okay, why did I do this? This tells me what alpha means. Alpha tells me how fast does this thing grow. Okay, when alpha is really, really small, it means that the doubling time, the doubling, the x double, is very small. When alpha is really large, right, if alpha is really large, then it'll take more time, more x, until I double. That's the meaning of the alpha in the equation. It tells me the rate of growth. So some of you are from biology. You know bacteria, and you know that sometimes you, when you do your uh, experiments and so on, you have uh, like the doubling time of the bacteria, right? How long does it take for, the, for your colony to grow? The doubling time. So that's alpha. Almost, right? It's ln 2 over alpha, but that's what alpha means. It means how long will it take your bacteria to double its growth. That's why I put in, that's why we had alpha here in the beginning. So if I put here 10 or 100 or 10, 
or whatever, or any other, any different uh, number, I'll always get an exponent, but the doubling time will be different. What? It just shows me what is how long it takes. Let's say uh, how how much how long it takes for the initial function to double to grow from f zero to two f zero. Maybe maybe we'll take it. Let's say that it's t instead of x. Okay, t like time. Maybe that'll be easier. Let's do t. T is time, and let's say f is the number of bacteria in your, in your colony. So T double tells me how long it'll take for the bacteria to double in its size. And it depends on this alpha. Now what is alpha in the lab? It depends on the mixture you give into your, like the, um, I forgot the word. Um, what? Right, like if you grow bacteria in a dish, it, it needs to have like nutrients and so on to eat. It depends on the environment. So if you have a good environment, that means that it's going to double faster. So that, so the environment will de will, will determine your alpha. Let's say. Uh, let's say population growth. Okay, when we're talking about population growth, it'd be how much kids do people have. Right, when people have a lot of kids on average, like fertility rate, in this term, it means that alpha would be small. Right, because the doubling time would be large. So alpha tells me, again, the rate of change of my function. OK? OK. So let's take another, let's take an example from our course. This is doubling time. OK. Um, OK, so do you guys remember that Uli talked about the survival curve S of, S of t and H of t? OK, so let's remind everyone. So S of t was the survival curve. When we're talking about a population of, let's say, people or bacteria or animals, and it starts at 1, everyone is alive at time 0, and it falls down until at some final t, everyone's dead. Right? You guys remember this vaguely? This we called S of t. It's also in the lecture notes. OK. And also, we had hazard. Hazard, when we talked about humans, this is on a log scale, hazard rose exponentially. Hazard was, in let's say, in words, it's kind of easiest to comprehend. It's a chance of dying of dying at age x, given that you made it to age x, if you're alive, if you're alive at start of age x. Chance of dying at a, let's say, let's say between, between age x and x plus 1, if you're at, if you're alive at the start of age x. So in words, it's like hazard means um, if you're alive at age 80, what are the chances that you're going to die in the following year? That's the hazard. And we discussed, we discussed that it, for humans, right, it, it's, it, go, it rises exponentially with time. And this is called Gompert's Law. And it's something that's well known for a very long time, and it's really interesting. What it means is that each year, uh, the chances of you dying rises exponentially. Uh, so live every moment like it's your last. Um, okay, so that was S, and that was that, that's H. Is there questions about what these mean? By the way, this isn't clear because it's important for the next part. Okay, so it can be shown like. That what is the relationship between them? So you can imagine that there's a relationship. Like they're not, they're not disconnected. If I know what my chances are of dying are each year, I can know what the survival is going to be, right? Because it's like there's a probability that people are going to die each year, right? And it turns out that the relationship between them, h of t, is equal to 
minus ds, let's call it h is hazard, ds over dt, this is the derivative, over s. Okay? This is the relationship between them. Um, in the lecture notes, I think Uli just shows briefly why this is true. But, you, but we can think about it also intuitively. It makes a lot of sense. We said h is the chance of dying at a given year if you're alive at the start of year. So ds over dt is how many people are dying, right? The change in survival. ds over dt is the change in the survival, how many died. But I'm dividing it by how many are still alive, which is s itself. So this is just like the math equivalence of the, of the um, verbal uh, description here. Now, what Uli said is that let's say there are animals in the wild, right? Animals in the wild that don't age because they're constantly eaten. Let's say rabbits that are always eaten by, by foxes, right? And that means that, th let's take for example that their hazard of these rabbits would be constant. That means that the chances of them dying each year are the same because the chances of getting caught by a fox are the same each year. So in this case, this would be some h0. And if I plug that back here, right, I'm going to have h0 equals minus ds over dt over s. And if I change sides, I'm going to have h0s equals minus ds over dt. Is this familiar? the same equation, right? It's the same equation, where now this is alpha minus h0. So the, all this example of the differential equation that we're talking about, radioactive decay and population growth, and na na na. So in a, in, a, in a hypothetical, let's say, rabbits who are constantly eaten by foxes at the same rate, you have a chance of getting eaten the same chance each year. And I want to ask, what is the survival of these rabbits? The answer is the same function, is the same equation as what we've been talking about this whole time. It's an exponential decay. And remember, we talked about alpha being the doubling time. So here, alpha is the hazard. When hazard is really high, it means that the chances of you getting eating are really large which means that the survival would drop really fast. This is what we talked about, the meaning of this alpha. It's the rate. It's the hazard. The hazard tells me how fast is the survival going to change. What are the chances of this fox eating me? OK. Questions? Yes. It's the rate of dying. ds over dt is the rate of dying, yes. So why again is it increasing this equation of the... Just this is the rate of dying. But when I divide it by s, it's the rate of dying divided by how many people are still alive at that time. So why the rate of dying divided by the hazard? OK, uh, let's take an example. Let's say that in a certain uh, dt, um, <clears throat> let's say in a certain uh, dt that you know that the survival dropped from, let's say, uh, 95 to 90. Right? So it dropped by 5% out of the total. And also, I could ask the same here. Let's say here it's 10% and it dropped to 5%. So here, let's say this would be the same here and this would be the same here. But here, there's a lot less people alive. So it means that the same number of people died if these two are, are if these two, if the derivatives here are equivalent. I didn't draw it like that, but imagine, for example, imagine, for example, that this and this are the same derivative, the same slope. So it means that 
this, the same number of people are dying here, here and here, because the drop is the same, but here there are less people alive. So it means that the chances of you dying are higher. Because if here there were, let's say, like, I don't know, right, 95 people alive, and here there's only 10 people alive, and five people died, so here it's going to be 5 over 95, and here it would be 5 over 10. So the chances would be half here, and here it would be much smaller. So by chance, you're actually meaning the probability. Probability, yeah. yeah. OK, uh, more questions? No? OK. Um, OK, now, I hope you don't hate me by now. But I don't think we have another TA, so it doesn't really matter. OK, I want to. I want to talk about solving ODEs with a computer, because this is something that maybe will make it more intuitive. OK. Let's take our very simple example. Let's say this. So we talked about how, how doing the math and how we take the integral and it's the logarithm and I take the exponent and all of that, right? No, no, no. But let's say you don't know any math and you don't care about math, but you still want to, which is probably true, <laughs> but you still want to solve this, right? So you can do it using a computer. And what I mean by solve it is I mean you won't have a function in the end. You won't have f of x equals something and you'll be happy and you'll show everyone your function. You'll say, hey, here's my solution. But you will be able to know using the computer, you, you will be able, able to construct an array of x <coughs> that's divided into f0, f1, f2, and so forth. And you'll know what the value of f is in each one of those time steps for, let's say, some array of time. Say T1, T0, T1, T2. So I'm going to talk about that now. OK? So like we said, um, another way to think about df dt is to think about delta f over delta t. Remember? So this is the most intuitive way to think about it. It's a tiny change of f over a tiny change of t. And it's some alpha times some f. This is the function we're talking about right now, the, uh, the, the equation we're talking about. Now, what is delta f? So if I look at some of my f, I don't know what it is. It's some function, right? And this would be, let's say, f of n, let's call it. And right next to it would be f of n plus 1, right? And this would be, sorry, uh, sorry. This would be over here, I'm sorry. Let's do it easier, sorry, like that, here and here. So this would be f of n, and this would be f of n plus 1, right? n is just some number. And this would be t of n, let's call it, and this would be t of n plus 1. So if I want to think about my function, which is actually just comprised of you know, these tiny f of n's, which are really close to each other. Um, I can write this as f of n plus 1 minus f of n divided by, right, tn plus 1 minus tn. Now this, when I use a computer, this is just called delta t. This is, a, this is some number that I'm going to use. Let's say I'm going to take, it's just, I get to decide how big this thing is. This is delta t. And let's say just for, right? So this would be, and over here would be alpha times, let's finish the equation, 
f of, what should I put here? f of? No? n. Right? f of n. So what, I'm, what I did here is I took the equation, I made it what's called in math discrete. In Hebrew, it's badid. I made it discrete, and then I opened it up. f n plus 1 minus f of n. And on the other side, I'm using f of n, where this is f of n, this is f of n plus 1. And now what I get is I can move sides. I can take delta t over here. I'm going to have f of n plus 1 minus f of n equals delta t times alpha f of n. And if I move the f of n over there, let's just see this, f of n plus 1 equals f of n times delta t alpha times f of n. Okay. This is what I was looking for. Why? Why? <laughs> Good question. Um, okay. Why? So let's say I know f of 0. I know because I decide what's 0, what time 0 is, and I decide how big my population is. I'm starting off with some bacteria. I know how much bacteria I put there. So I know what f0 is. And I, I'm going to use a specific delta t in the computer. We'll talk about that in a second. This tells me that f of 1 is going to be f0 plus delta t times alpha f0. And then I can do f2 equals f1 plus delta t times alpha f1. And then I can do f3 equals f2 plus delta t times f2. So I have a method on the computer to, to take my initial condition, which I know, and to solve the following f's. I know how to get from here to here, and then from here to here, and then from here to here. I don't know, I don't know math. I don't know any math here. I don't, it doesn't matter. I don't know how to solve this. I don't know exponents or logarithms. I don't know anything. All I know is that this is a derivative that I opened up, I moved sides, and now I have what's called a prescription in computer science or something like that, a prescription for how to propagate my f forward. And I can do this indefinitely. I can just continue until f of infinity. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so now let's, now let's play with this. Okay. Should, uh, um, okay, so maybe I'll try to put this, I'll put this so it won't run away from us. Uh, let's put it here. F of n plus 1 equals f of n plus alpha delta t f of n. Okay, this is what, this is what we used. This is what we found. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's, let's, uh, let's do it on the computer and see that it works, then that I wasn't lying to you. And by the way, this is, um, this is for, for, for the specific, okay, we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so first this is Python. Anyone use Python? Yes. Baruch Hashem. Um, Okay, so we said this is our analytic solution. Remember, we solved for f of n. It's all the way over there, all the way on the other side of the, on the, uh, of the, of the screen. And here it's y0. It doesn't matter. Y, f. I hope it won't confuse you. It's just, we can also define it as f. 
Okay? And now what we need is we need to know what, um, let's call it, um, f starts off to be f0. Right? We said we're, I decide what f0 is. I'm going to solve the equation. I need to tell my computer. I need to tell whoever. I need to know what the initial f0 is. No one tells me that. I decide what f0 is. How much bacteria did I put in the, in the dish when I went home? That's my f0. I decide. So I have f0. And let's say I want a starting time. So we'll call it t equals t0. Right? And we're, oh, sorry. And uh, let's call it t start. And let's say we start from 0. And we have t end. And let's say we stop at 10. OK? Um, and we have our analytic solution, f0 times, so let's just run that. f0 is not defined. Yeah, Wonderful. We've got y. Yeah. We can let, you, what, what do you want f0 to be? Shiv, what? Seven. Seven? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about how we did, we had our um, prescription. It's using this. Right? So what it means is I'm going to write a function called Euler method. I didn't say, but it's, this is called Euler's method. It's not so important, but let's use a function. It's, it's called uh, Euler's method. Let's call it, uh, this is going to be dy dt, y0. And the, the inputs I'm going to need, I'm going to need dy of dt. So remember, we said that dy over dt in our example is going to be alpha times Sorry, F. I'm sorry with the Y and the X. Do it like that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I need to know what is this side of the function. And in our case, it's just F. So we're going to use that shortly. I need to know when Could does... Larger? What? Could you make it larger? Yeah. Thank you. Better? Yes, thank you. Yes. OK, so first I need to know, so what are the inputs? I have the right side of the equation. I have f of 0, which we're going to use. I have t start when I'm starting the integration, uh, the, the solution. So in our case, let's say it's going to be from 0, right, up to, I don't know, it doesn't matter, 7 or someone said 10. 7 is f0. Um, OK, so now we need to know how many time steps uh, are there. Oh, and also I need dt. I'm sorry. dt, remember, is when we divided this. It's an input. When we did this fn, fn plus 1, right? This was f of n. This was f of n plus 1. No one told me how big this is. I decide. I decide. And now we're going to see what happens when we take different dt. I think that's what you asked. Is a great question. How does it impact? We're going to see. So, and it also has dt. So, firstly, the question is how many times, how many steps, how many dt's are we going to jump, right? So, it's going to be uh, the integer of, see, I think my code even knows, right? It's going to be t end minus t, why does it say start divided by t. That's how many jumps I'm going to do. If I do from 0 to 5 in jumps of 1, it's going to be 5. 1, 2, 3, 4. If I do in jumps of half, half, 1, 1 and a half, 2, and so on. OK, let's uh, make uh, an array of time points. So we can do t start plus <coughs> dt times np range. OK, so now this is just going to be my, this is, hold on, let me, let me I'm sorry. This, I wasn't expecting it to hide the board like this. Um, so t points is this. I'm going array that starts at t0, which we said is 0, and it jumps in dt. Right? t1, t2, t3. So this is going to be dt. This is going to be 2dt, 3dt, and so on. I'm just defining the, the, the array that I'm going to use. It's an input of the function that I decide. Every time you call function? Yes. This is, I'm going to, it, it's, it's an input that tells me 
how, how big am I going to take the, 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 the change from f to the next f? And I decide I can take it really small, I can take it big, and someone asked a great question, wait, but it, 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 the solution we're going to get is going to depend on dt, and that's true. And that's why we're going to see, like, sometimes we need to find the right dt. No, the same dt, but I choose what is the dt. The jumps are the same. If I use if I use a different jump, the solution, yeah, the solution will be a bit different. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we can also use. Let's uh, call it a y. Um, Let's call our solution a prox because it's actually just an approximation, right? This is like solving it using. I A I. F zero. Do I need to define F zero somewhere? Probably. Yes, I do. Let's define it as well. F prox equals yes, just like that. Okay. So now I defined also this one, f a prox, and it's going to be divided into the same kind of rubric, right? And right now we're just saying, and all I know is this one, f0. That's all I know. That's what I start from. I don't know anything else. Um, and, I, and now we're going to use this prescription to solve it. OK. A set initial condition that we did. Okay. Right. And now we're going to take a for loop because this is a for loop, right? The board is uh, blocking it. But uh, right, we go from F0 to F1, F1 to F2, F2 to F3. No, 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 no. So I have a for loop and I'm going to run over all my different DTs. And each time I'm going to define f previous, which will be my previous f, which was f of n, right? f of n, let's call it f previous. And t will be, um, we don't need t right now. And the f nu will be, as we said, f previous plus you know what? We don't need this. It'll be easier without it. Right? Plus dt times uh, f approximate. And we'll let's put in alpha as well. Right? Because we didn't use alpha. So we need to add that here. OK? So this, this line is this. I just wrote it in the computer. What? I don't hear you. Ah, this one, yeah, yeah, of course. And then I said, I just say that the new f, fn plus 1, is going to be f nu. Ah, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. OK. And we're going to return in the end, right, t points and f approx. So at the end of this for loop, I'm going to get back this and this. OK. Let's define the function. Um, and now we can run the function. Wait, what is this? Don't need this. Don't need this. Okay, now let's use dt. Let's do alpha equals. So now let's define everything. We said f0 equals 7, dt equals half, let's start. Alpha, let's start with 1. t start, let's say, is 0. t end, let's say, is 10. OK? And this would be f of 0. And we also have our analytic solution that also needs to take an alpha. 
because we said let's do it like that. So we have our analytic solution. This is analytic solution means what we solved for over here. This is the math that we did. This is the exact solution. This is the mathematics, and we have the approximate solution. So we can define that, and we have this. And now we define dt and f0 and alpha and nah, 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 and all of that, and we have this and y exact, right? And now we can plot them together. So I'm calling the function that we used, and I have the exact solution, and now I'm going to plot the exact one and the approximate solution. And there's an error. Uh, wait, this one? No? Uh, it needs alpha first. Oh, didn't do so good. Right? Oh, what? Someone said the uh, info, right? So uh, let's add the legend. Okay, so it doesn't look so good, right? <laughs> what do you expect to see? Okay, what I expect to so what what I expect to see is that the red line follows the blue line, but it doesn't. And that's where we took a certain DT, and it didn't work so well. So let's take a smaller DT to see if it'll work better. Let's take 0 0.1. Getting better, right? OK, let's take even smaller. Let's take, what? <laughs> 0 0.05, almost there. Let's take 0, 0, 001, just to be sure. Wow. <laughs> so this was an example to show you how, without knowing any math at all, we can solve the equation. And the only thing we know, well, the only thing I need to know is where I start from. Okay. Where I start from and how big I want my DTs to be. And as someone asked here, that we can see that the dt really impacts the solution. And that's why when we solve, numer uh, this is called numerically solving the equation. When we numerically solve an equation, we always need to be careful that we're taking a dt that converges to the exact solution. Now, how would we know? Let's say you don't know the answer. What? It's not really, I mean, I can take it now smaller, but it won't matter so much, right? I can take it, I can take even smaller. So it is my choice. It isn't my choice in the sense of I need to take it a minimum value, right? A maximum value I can't. So how would I decide what is a good DT? Like how would, let's say, right, the whole point of this was to show you that you don't need to know math to solve a differential equation. But now I'm comparing the computer to solution to the analytic solution. And now I stopped when I said, oh, they fit so well. But but if I don't know the analytic solution, how do, how do I do this? Very good. That's the answer. I'm looking for convergence. So I check lots and lots of different DTs, and I see from what DT does my solution look the same? What is the smallest DT? Tell me when to stop. My computer will blow up. I won't do it. The most accurate is always, I mean, I, right? Because this is an, an approximate solution where I'm taking something continuous and I'm making it discrete, right? In Hebrew, okay, so the best case scenario would always be to take it as small as possible. But I mean, when I'm solving things on the computer, I need it to take a finite amount of time. I want, you know, not enough, res I want it not to take a, uh, so much resources. If I run it like this, it'll take like an hour to solve or even more and my computer will heat up. But I don't need to take it that big because we saw that it converges. Um, let's see if we have a way to, um, for us to do this. So now we can do, let's do like that. 
let's say dt's equals one half 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, right? And then let's do four dt and dt's. Thank you. Right, and now let's. I hear you. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. I see it. I see it. Okay. Right. So now let's do that, and this one I'll do outside. So now I'm plotting the exact one outside. OK. So I won't do it every time. OK. And alpha we can also put outside. And t points. Where is t points? Oh. Uh, OK, never mind. Let's just do it like that. Oh, we didn't do it on the same one. I just want to show you. Um, right, let's just do that. Okay, here. Okay, it's uh, the 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 colors are off, but actually the colors are really bad. Let's. Okay, so here, I just wanted to show you what someone said is when I take a too big dt, the solution is really bad, and I take dt smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until I see that it pretty much converges. Now, if I zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, there will always be a difference, right? It will never actually be the same because I'm, I'm taking a more accurate solution. So how do you know what is the dt that's right for you? Um, so it's, it, it's a matter of how, what is the accuracy that you need in your solution. So it, it depends on, on what you're trying to solve and how accurate you need to be. So for instance here, right now, the difference between here and here is like, I don't know, thousands. So that's pretty bad. But if I zoom in, the accuracy will probably be, you know, the difference will be like in the tens or in the ones. And that may be enough for you, but maybe not. I mean, it always depends on the exact type of question you're trying to solve. But you do get a sense where you tr where you pretty much see that it starts to converge, or to a good degree. Um, no, now I'm comparing it to each other. No, I'm comparing it to each other, not to the analytic. I'm talking about what is the change between this one and this one, and between this one and this one, and this one and this one. I don't know the let's say I didn't, don't know the analytical solution at all. Now let me just say I think we're okay. Just one final thing, we and then we'll, we're done. Um, Okay, we talked about dy to dt, f again, uh, equals alpha f, and we solved it with the computer. But I just want to say that I could also write df by dt equals some general function of f. Let's call it g of f, right? It could be something really weird. It could be f to the third divided by sinus of f. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't know. It doesn't matter because I have the computer. I can always solve this. Right? I don't need to know the math. That's the kind of the, the what's so special about the numerical uh, solutions that we can we can solve different differential equations, even hard ones that we don't know how to solve using math with a computer. That's it. Okay.